Thank the Lord for Jesus. Amen. That's why we're here, you know. It's all because of Him. It's wonderful to know the Lord, isn't it? What a privilege and honor it is to be here. I thank the Lord so much for the opportunity. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, to the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verse 9. The Bible says two are better than one because they have a good reward, notice, for their what? Labor. You're not going to have a good marriage unless you labor, work at it. I want to speak this evening on 10 ways to protect your marriage. Pastor was able to share some things that, that pose the condition of our nation. The home is under attack. We understand that. The Bible says, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. There's many things that God's Word teaches us that can help us to protect our marriages. The devil is the evil one, and he's seeking to devour and destroy marriages. He's a thief. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. And he wants to destroy marriages. I was reading a book, The Holy War, it's called. A very interesting book. There was a city, a walled, gated city called Mansoul. And the head of that city was El Shaddai. But there was a man named Diopolis that was working his way around that city trying to get in. An unprotected city is a defeated city. An unprotected marriage is a defeated marriage. And it's amazing, these different doors, these different gates, the ear gate, the eye gate, the hand gate, the feet gate, are all ways in which Satan gets in. And he'll circle your life a thousand times for just one crack in that gate. I want to tell you something, folks. We need to protect our marriage. Number one, please write these down if you would. I believe one of the most important things that you must do to protect your marriage is to prove that you are truly born of the Spirit of God. 1 John 5, 13 says that we may what? Know that we have eternal life. But I want to tell you something about that. It's one thing for me to say, I know that I have eternal life. It's another thing for you to say it. The Lord Jesus made it clear by their fruit, ye shall know them. There needs to be fruit demonstrated in your life to prove that you're a child of God. There's a lot of spouses that don't prove that they're born of the Spirit of God. I'm sure there's some wives that wish their husbands would prove it. And some husbands that wish their wife would prove it. Because if you don't take a stand in the home, if you don't take a stand at work, if you don't take a stand at church, there's going to be people that are going to say, you know what, I wonder if that person's really saved. I had done some things that had offended my father and my dad was in the bathroom shaving. He had shaving cream all over his face, a razor in his hand. And he heard me come in. He said, is that you, Daniel? And I said, yes. And 
He stepped out of the bathroom into the hallway looking at me sitting in the chair in the living room. And it was really kind of hilarious the way he looked. But what he said was not. He said, Daniel, I've never seen any indication that you're really saved. And then he went back to shaving. First serious moment in my life. I got thinking about that and I said, you know, I don't see any evidence either. And I went and got my Bible and I led myself to Christ. Sitting there in the rocking chair, amen. I was so thrilled about it. By then my dad went off to work and wherever he went and uh, he came back that night and I thought, man, I'm going to tell him. He'll be thrilled. You kidding? I said, dad, guess what I did today? And he said, what, son? He was still peeved at me about something I'd done. I said, I got saved today. He said, we'll see. <laughs> I think there's some people that like to see that you really know the Lord as your Savior. Prove it. Anybody can say they're saved. But live for Jesus Christ. Number two. Number two. Fear God. Fear God. Did you know, men, that fearing God is your spouse's greatest security? You want to make your wife real happy? Fear God. And vice versa. Fearing God is something that's so precious because... Proverbs chapter 5 verse 21 says for the ways of a man are be uh, the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord and he pondereth all his doings God is watching me not just once in a while but his presence is there every moment do you have the holy spirit you have his presence if you're saved and we need to fear the Lord I fear sometimes that I could be barred from the throne of God. That is, my prayers would not be heard because I regard an iniquity in my heart. With all the things going on in this world today, I fear that I could be banned from the service of the Lord. Better men than I have fallen. Better couples than you have fallen. I'll tell you what, we better fear that we could fall. I don't want to be barren at the judgment either. I fear that I could stand before the Lord one day and Him not say to me, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, may God help us to have a fear of God, sensing His presence and knowing that that He is watching over us, and as we fear Him, we draw closer to Him, not further away. You know, there are people that are afraid of getting caught in their sin. You don't have to worry about that when you fear the Lord because you're living a squeaky clean life. That's the way to live. Oh, listen, when I fear the Lord, I'm happy. Amen? Number three. A husband and wife need to pray together. Just hold hands and thank God for another day. Amen. I like to hear my wife pray. Go right into her soul when she prays, you know. You find out what she believes is important. Amen. What she believes is is important. We need to pray together. My mother would get up early and make oatmeal on the stove, and then she'd go to the boys' dorm. <laughs> Five boys slept in one big room. She'd say, boys, get up. Breakfast is on the table, on the stove. And then she'd go out and sit in the chair. She'd read her Bible. This happened every morning of my life. If I got up late, which was normally the case, there she'd be kneeling 
at that chair, and I know who she was praying for, me. My dad used to take his Bible and walk off to Sanford Lake, and there was an old tree that had fallen over, and he'd go over there and get alone with God. And he always came back encouraged. Prayer encourages you. Prayer takes you right into the throne room of God. And there's no greater place than to be in his presence. Why don't we pray more? Why do we give up on things? Why do we question God? Why do we keep our eyes on the circumstances, even within our own marriage, and say, oh, it's not going to ever be what I want it to be? God can make it exactly what he wants it to be. But you've got to pray. Keep a list. Pray constantly. Oh, God is so good when you pray. When you pray, you sense his presence. Number four, stay in the word. Stay in the word as a couple. Hey, if it's just a verse, if it's just a little devotion, make sure you do that. You need to spend time together. Oh, our schedules are crazy. Crazy. I went to a time management course one time and the guy said, write down all the things that you do, you preachers. And I had 19 things I'd written down. And he said, all right, check off all the ones that you could get somebody else to do that you don't absolutely have to do. And so half of those 18 things I checked off. And he said, you're robbing your church of a blessing. So I thought, yeah, that's right. Why am I working so hard? You know, spending time away from my wife, you know, we're like, you know, soldiers going past each other in the night, you know, I mean, our time was never together. It was always doing something for somebody else that later cuts your throat. Yeah, you ever have that happen to you? Your best friend, you know. So I put it in the bulletin. Pastor Knickerbocker has been robbing his congregation of blessings. And within three weeks, all those things were taken away. Amen. Don't tell me you don't have time to hug on your wife and sit down together and read a couple verses and pray. Good night, you spend more time buying coffee out than you do spend time with your wife. Hmm. Stay in the word. Be faithful in the church too. I think faithfulness in the word is faithfulness in the church. Now you got to watch this church business. You can get in so involved in church, you don't even have any time for your Lord. Now, that's ridiculous. Do stuff together in the church. Amen? Ride to church together. That might be a rare thing for you to do. Huh? Go home at the same time. But find something that you can do together so that you can pray about what you're doing together. And I know there's ministries. You're not going to get up, ladies, at, you know, 5.30 to get on a bus. Amen. We understand that. Well, maybe you would. I hope you would if you're working in a bus ministry. Amen. But I want to tell you, you need to make sure that you're faithful in the work of the Lord and serving God. It's so important that you be involved in serving, showing your children that That the work of God is important. You know, my parents never gave me a reason to want to not want to serve the Lord. They loved it. And we thought, they love it. I guess I can love it. Yeah, we got up early in the morning. Dad kicked us out of bed, you know, and said, get up there and get the stove warmed up. We had a wood stove, two potbelly stoves in the back of a church my dad bought for for $200, a Methodist church, amen. 
We got that, we got that stove so hot, man, it, we'd take snowballs and put them up on top and watch them bounce around, you know. We thought the ministry was fun. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Oh, listen, if your children don't think the ministry is fun, guess what? They'll say, ah, you go ahead and go on to church. Uh, I got better things to do. It's like that time I said to my dad, Dad, I think I want to grow long hair. <laughs> and he said, well, where are you going to live? <laughs> and I got thinking about it, three squares a day, a roof over my head. I'm going to keep my hair short. That's what I'm going to do. My wife said to me the other day, why did you say that to him? Nah, sometimes a son likes to shock his dad, you know. <laughs> Boy, he shocked me more than I ever shocked him, I can tell you that. <laughs> we, we went on whaling expeditions, me and my dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were patriotic in our home. He gave the stripes and I saw the stars and... I went to, wed, uh, to, went to bed whistling Stars and Stripes forever, boy, I'll tell you. Whew, man, I'm telling you. Oh, number five. Be careful who and what you spend time with. I think this is probably the most dangerous thing that's happening in our couple's lives today. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the what? Counsel of the ungodly. It's amazing how you can take your advice from somebody that has no experience and throw away the, the advice of somebody that does. Children are guilty of that. I have a 29-year-old and a 30-year-old, and it's amazing how they're not a bit interested in my advice. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because they want to live their life the way they want to live their life. And some of the things that they may do, I may not do, but I had my chance to make an impact on their life, and I just committed them to the Lord. Amen. And I thank the Lord for my kids, and I thank the Lord for what he's done for them. But I want to say something that is very important. I need to be careful how I live with my wife. You say, what do you mean? If I could do anything I wanted to do for one whole week and there was no expense that I would have to pay, it was all paid for, would I want to do something with my wife that week or would I want to go do something else? Did you know that if you're not careful, you'll live separate lives? Have you ever been out watching couples eat anymore? I mean, we, were, we took our teens, we took our college students one time to a church and all the teens were texting each other and nobody talked to them. Pretty amazing, I thought. I was like, wow, we're living in a new generation. The computer is destroying marriages. Nothing wrong with the computer. Nothing at, at all wrong with the computer. It's what you're doing with it. Nothing wrong with a, with a video game. Nothing wrong with maybe fantasy football or something like that. Nothing wrong with golf. Nothing wrong with basketball. But when it takes you away from quality time with your spouse, you're messed up. Yeah, I'm messed up. My wife and I were sitting there. She's got the computer going. She's doing Pinterest or Pinterest, or whatever it is. And I'm doing this. <laughs> trying to find something, can't find anything. We're thinking, you know, we could be in the living room holding hands or something like that. I mean, we could literally be enjoying ourselves. No, no, no. What's wrong with us? You know, my father had a solution for m media. He did. He really did. We didn't have a TV in our home. My dad thought they were of the devil. And I'm not kidding. He preached against them in long hair. Amen. Every Sunday. Woo! Amen. 
I mean, he was serious about it. Well, one family must not have heard a thing he said, and they, they, they came by to our house, and they brought us a beautiful... Now, this, I'm, I'm dating myself, but it was a, one of those oak console televisions. It was longer than my, my arm spanned with the TV in the middle, you know. And he goes, oh, thank you so much. I'm going, Dad's compromising. Amen. <laughs> you know, and in comes the TV. I mean, we thought it was an idol or something, you know. That's what we'd been taught. And anyway, Dad let him set it all up and everything, and he thanked them, and they left. And he said, uh, boys, go get your tools. And I went, we need our tools? He goes, yeah. He said, there's some screws in there that will pull that, that big tube out. He said, you know, you can smash them things, and they go boom, and white smoke comes pouring out of them. I said, you're kidding. <laughs> Amen. So we went after it. And he made a bookshelf out of that, out of that TV console to put his theological books in it. <laughs> Gentlemen, may I tell you, I never lusted over that television. Hope you get the point. The TV. Oh, by the way, when your wife goes to bed, you go to bed. Amen? If the husband goes to bed, you follow him in and cuddle a little bit. Amen. Now, if he starts snoring, my wife just plugs my nose. Amen. <laughs> Wakes me right up out of it. Amen. Then I start again. <laughs> but you know what, what's happening? We, we, we're, we're not careful with who we spend time with or what we spend time with. And the terrible truth is that, that if we would just protect just a little of that time. I know you have to go to work. But you don't work all the time, do you? I know you've got hobbies. Hobbies have ruined a lot of marriages, too. I've got a solution for hobbies. This works. Whatever you, fella, whatever you spend on your toys, she gets the same amount of money. Can I get a holy grunt here? <laughs> wow, I've never seen a crowd so quiet. <laughs> equal time, equal dime, amen? <laughs> Woo! Be careful. <laughs> you may find that some of your hobbies are going to take leave. Number six, guard your reactions, like right now. <laughs> Guard your reactions. Isn't it amazing how everything's going fine and then your wife makes some statement and all of a sudden it makes you ripping mad. It was basically she didn't agree with you about something. I heard, I heard about a fellow one time. His wife was just giving him too much advice. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about nagging. That's worse. But, but too much good advice. And he finally got tired of it. And he turned to his wife and I, he, you know, there's a process. Think, then, no, think, then speak. Now, those are very close to each other. Well, guess what he forgot to do? He forgot to think. And you're not going to believe what he said. He said, why don't you just go home to your mother? And she did. <laughs> she, she packed up a suitcase, jumped in the car. I mean, minutes, gone. Brother Knickerbocker, <laughs> my wife left me. This is a preacher, by the way. He said, could you preach for me tomorrow? Uh, what happened? Did you have someone die? Huh. Yeah, something died all right. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, yeah, I can get one of my men to cover for me. I'll come over and preach for you tomorrow. I said, what happened? 
he said, you know, you know, in the ministry, you know, you've got these decisions you have to make, and sometimes your wife just keeps talking about stuff. And I get sick of it, and I, I just told her to go home to her mother, and she did, and I need to go get my wife. So he said, I'll tell you what, I'll put, a, I'll put a note on the pulpit, and you just show up. I'm not telling anybody. Just read that note, and then you preach. Oh, thanks. <laughs> he got through it. He's still pastoring with the same wife. Amen. <laughs> Pretty amazing, isn't it? You better guard your reactions. You know, it's one thing to think something. It's another thing to say it. Wow. Sometimes it's really good not to say anything. Do you wonder why your husband's so quiet? <laughs> oh, man. You must, you must guard your reaction. You must guard your reaction. Um, my wife and I, we, we try to get along okay, and um, I've discovered that, you know, there's certain things that you'd like to see your wife do that she doesn't do, maybe. Anybody relate to that? And it's amazing how that, that my wife responds much better to me when I respond correctly to her. You know what I mean? It does work. And oh, we must guard our reaction. Don't hurt your wife. My dad, my dad gave my wife and I counseling, a, one counseling session. It lasted for about, well, it was one sentence. Well, it really was only two words. It went like this. Daniel, you be kind to Anne-Marie. I thought, boy, that's better than 10 weeks of marital counseling, right? Did you know that'll take care of about every problem you have? If you'll just be kind. Your reactions need to be seasoned with kindness. Amen. You know, I found out something, that if I'm decently right with God, my wife, and I, my wife and I get along great. It's when I'm not right with God, my wife and I have most of our problems. It's when I get in the flesh. Romans 6 tells us that we're to be dead, indeed unto sin, and alive unto God. We need to die. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul even said, I die daily. Yeah, high energy people have to do that. Yeah. Dead beats maybe once a month. <laughs> but you've got to die. You've got to say, how would I feel if, I, if my wife said that to me? Amen. Guard your reactions. Number seven, cast down every imagination that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Bring into captivity every thought, notice, to the obedience of Christ. You know, my mom and dad really got along great. I, I, I never remember my parents ever having a fight. Never in my, in, in my lifetime. So I, I, I thought I would challenge my mother one day, and I said, Mom, don't you and dad ever fight? She said, you can't stay awake forever. I said, you do fight then. When? Well, after you kids go to bed, we talk. And we, we get everything ironed out then so that we're a united front when we have to deal with you boys. I could never get anything over on them. Amen. I'd go to mom and say, mom, can I do this? She goes, what did your father say? I'm not asking my father. <laughs> go ask your father. Dad, can I do this? What did your mother say? Um, I already asked her, and she said to ask you. And then they he would make the decision. If it was the other way around, she would make the decision. And you know what? 
They never yelled at each other over the decision they made for us. Ah, let him do it, David. Oh, no. No, just this once, Lois. No, 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 no. No, they were united. Oh, listen, that's so important. That is like life and death in a marriage. You must understand each other and you must work together. I remember a few times, I think my mother got real nervous when dad was whipping all of us at one time. <laughs> she was like, ooh, ooh, ah, I wonder if that's enough. Mm. No, she never said that. She just walked off. And she goes, give it to him. Ah, <laughs> uh, give it to him. <laughs> I remember one time, this is, this is really, really sad. I, I did something that irritated my mother and dad wasn't home and so my mom... She, she was upset. Now, my mother was short and stout, and she had the teeniest little hands you ever laid your eyes on. I mean, the smallest hands. And she came over to me. I mean, she lost it. And she started going, bam, 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 right on my shoulder. And it, I mean, it really felt good. And I went, <laughs> ah. And boy, did she. She said, you wait till your father gets home. Now, when she said that, that's when it gets real serious. So dad comes home, and he comes walking in, sits down, and mom was disturbed. Lois, everything okay? No. What happened? What did the boys do now? She said, Daniel just, you know, disrespected, whatever. I can't even remember what it was. And he said, well, did you take a two-by-four and smack him over the head? She said, no. She said, I just started beating him with my fist and he laughed at me. Get a two by four, Lois. That's the only thing that works with him. <laughs> and you know what? He never gave me a whipping. Whew. Well, there was another time, and this, this is a sad story. I, I, I decided I wanted to be a thief. And uh, I was about 13 years old. I got me a... When it, was, it was in the wintertime, and we were in New York, and I got a nice trench coat. I cut a lining, lining in it, I cut the lining, and I set it up so you could put ice cream sandwiches in there. <laughs> and I, I went and got some ice cream sandwiches, stole them from Nate Morehouse's store. And it was smooth. It really went smooth. And I, I got in, got out. Nobody even knew. Bought something. Perfect crime. <laughs> Problem is, I'm walking down the street in the winter eating these ice cream sandwiches, and I didn't realize how many I'd gotten. And I am like, hum, 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 you know, destroying the evidence, putting the pocket, you know, the papers in the pocket, and I'm, I'm like stuffed, you know, and I've got a quart of, of fawn orange soda. You know, really, really a big shot now, boy. I, I, I committed a crime and got away with it. A month goes by, and uh, I thought... <laughs> This is great. I could probably do this again. Well, maybe something different, but it worked. Went to supper, sat down at the supper table. I'll never forget, I was on one end of the table, my dad was on the other end. We're sitting there eating away, no big deal. He looks down that table at me and he said, Daniel, have you been stealing from Nate Morehouse's store? Now, in all of my wisdom, I lost my presence of mind. And I said, how did you find out? And then I, and then I realized what I'd said. Whew. Oh, you have them? I didn't know whether you were or not. I just thought I'd ask you. Blew it. And then he wore me out that's called a woodshed, bloodshed experience. And then he took me up to Nate Morehouse's store and he made me tell Mrs. Morehouse what I had done. She said, I thought somebody was stealing her. I did inventory the other day. She was mean and ugly and fat. Yeah. Now her husband was really nice and sweet, but boy, we got her that day. She said, I knew somebody stole something, taken something, because it, was, it wasn't in the inventory. 
And I had to pay that back. Every one of them. My dad cured me of stealing. You know what the problem is, parents? Sometimes you don't even want to ask your kids any questions because you know if you do, you're going to have to deal with it. And you don't want to deal with it. Well, you know what one, one rebellion that you get away with leads to? Another one. You know what happens when a husband becomes rebellious and he gets away with it? Another one. The Bible talks in Isaiah chapter 30 about adding sin to sin. You know what happens? There's a tumbling effect, and the damage is unbelievable. Oh, be careful. Ask God to help you. Anytime the thought comes into your mind that dishonors God, cast it away. It could save you from ruin. Oh, may God help us. Number eight. Give attention and appreciation to your spouse. It's the little things that make the difference. It's not so much how much it costs, it's that you thought of doing something special for your spouse. When you give attention, that means you're listening. Have you ever had your wife have to say to you four or five times the same thing before you really knew what she said? You weren't listening. Sometimes my wife will grab my fat cheeks and just <laughs> boom, boom. I'm talking to you. <laughs> it works, man. You want to kiss while we're talking? Amen. Huh? You want my attention? I'll give you my attention. Hey, you know what appreciation is? Appreciation means that you're thankful. When you're thankful, you're a giver, not a taker. You'd rather give than take. Giving, giving always brings great dividends. Amen. I, I you know, I, for a long time, when we first got married, I, my dad never brought flowers home good night if he could bring milk and bread home that was a big deal I mean so I, I didn't learn some of those things you know bracelets and rings and all kinds of stuff like that my mother she wasn't fancy good night and um, so I get married and I become a pastor and then well I, I became a pastor then I got married eight months later and you know I start funerals started taking place and so you know you go out to the graveyard and of course you know, some of the men of the church or the people that are there said, would you, would you take some of the flowers back to the church and so you can have them in the church for Sunday? We'd like to do that in our mother's memory. And I'd say, sure, love to do it. I'd take that stuff back to the church and then I'd grab me four or five out of there. <laughs> Buddy, I'd give my wife a dead giveaway, amen. <laughs> she was like, What'd you do, have another funeral? <laughs> you know, I mean, you got to do better than that, right? Yeah. But, you know, you learn over a period of time that she says that. That's why I got out of the ministry, by the way, pastorate specifically. <laughs> Just kidding. Give attention and appreciation. Amen. Number nine. Get counsel before it's too late. Have you ever felt, and I know I have felt this way, and I think every couple has felt this way, that there are some times where you feel like, oh, man, my marriage is bleh. Of course, she's probably saying the same thing. <laughs> bleh, bleh. <laughs> you know, man, there's nothing new happening where there's no excitement anymore, and we're just bored to death with each other. And You know, you need some help. You need some help. Some people don't know what they're supposed to do. So they do the wrong thing. Get some counsel. Find a couple that, that you see really have a good relationship and get some accountability going. Get some encouragement, some counsel. 
Amen. Sometimes it's hard to get your Bible and sit down with your wife and act spiritual. Sometimes you're way beyond that point. You need help. Listen, you need help. You better get it before it's too late. And then I close with number 10. Maintain an exciting intimacy. You know what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, if you'd like to turn there, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 9. This is a beautiful verse. I want you to go there, if you would, in closing. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9. This is a verse for all of you, specifically for the husband. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest. How long? All the days of thy life which he hath given thee under the sun. For that is thy portion. Now I want you to think about these three words, what you get. For this or that is thy portion. That's what you get as the husband. In this life and in thy labor, that's what you give. When you labor in your marriage, you always give. That's the labor. And then you receive reward for your labor. I don't know about you, but I like to get a deal. And I believe when I got married, man, I got, I got a wonderful wife. But you know what? When I don't give, I don't get. You say, well, that's a wrong motive. I know. I'm unspiritual sometimes. And so are you. If you really love me. No, why don't you love me? Why don't you show me you love me all day long? All, let's do all week long. Why don't we just go a whole month and show me that you really love me? See, when people don't respond to us the way we would like them to, what do we do? We get mad. We clam up. We go silent. We cut off blessings. And we're losers when we do that. May God help us. I'll tell you what. God created marriage to be wonderful all the time. Do you believe that? Talking about marriage is God's design. Do you think God wanted you to get married so you could be miserable? You did that to yourself. He gave you a wife a husband, that you might have the joy of the Lord in companionship, in relationship, emotionally. He gave all of that to you. What are you going to do with it? Let's bow together in a word of prayer.